Well, once again, we're so glad you can be with us here this evening as we have an opportunity just to continue in this series, looking at the life of Christ, looking at it as, as the story, seeing the movement. And again, for me, this has been incredibly helpful because I have a tendency just to approach this from the perspective of kind of like these disconnected events, right? So you read them and you, and you see it kind of as a singular thing, and then you move on to the next singular thing. And, and really, that's not what's happening at all. It's, it, it is a story. If you're a part of our all-time bestseller book club, um, you're reading it as a story as well. Um, and I want to begin this evening by just asking you a question. To think if, of a time, if you can recall some time when someone that you looked up to believed in you. Someone that you looked up to expressed how much they believed in you. It could have been a coach or a teacher or a parent or a boss or, or an older sibling. If you, can, if you can bring that moment to mind, I have, a, I, I have a tendency, these have a tendency to be powerful moments in, in our lives. Um, moments that sort of stick with us, that, that inspire us. And on the flip side of that, um, perhaps you think of moments when you have felt like someone failed to believe in you. As, as a youth pastor, um, I, I have hard conversations with, with students far too often um, where they feel like someone that they love or that they look up to them has told them that they're worthless or that they're unwanted, or that they're a failure. I've had conversations with adults where those, those experiences in their life um, have, have wounded them well into their adulthood, that they continue to, to carry them with them. Those are powerful moments as well. They can affect us for, for a long time when somebody fails to believe in us and went unchecked, um, not only do they continue to hurt us, oftentimes they continue to, to hurt those around us, those, those that we love. I think, it, I think it's really amazing when you think about it, the kind of impact that believing in someone or the vice versa, the, the, the uh, refusal or the failure to believe in someone can have in an individual's life can have in, in, in my life. I remember specifically a man by the name of Bob Weishart. Actually, some um, of our families over at the East Campus um, know him and have been a friend of him. When I was a young youth pastor um, at the church I was at at the time, there was an interim and the pastor had left. And so Bob came in to serve as the interim pastor. He's a retired um, pastor. And so he was just doing this kind of out of the own kindness of his heart to help us kind of in this in-between time. And he made this intentional effort, not only to get to know me, but also to invest in me. And when I look at the individuals, the, the different people, specifically as it, it relates to my career trajectory and my role as a pastor and those sorts of things, one of the most influential and insp uh, uh, inspirational people in my life, my experience, is Bob Weishart. Because I admired him, for one. I could see that God had used him in powerful and incredible ways, that he had just this um, real relationship with him, but that he took the time to sit down next to somebody who didn't know what they were doing and, and was most of the time operating out of a sense of, of oftentimes fear and said, stop doing that. Like, I, I believe in you. I see that God is working in your life. I see that he wants to use you in ministry. I see these things in you operate out of, of that. That was a powerful experience in my life. He was instrumental in who I am as, as a pastor, as a, even as a, as a father and, and as a husband. I have pictures of, of Bob and his wife Miriam holding my, my first daughter um, after she was born because they were so invested in our lives. He saw something in me. He, he believed in me and he communicated that to us. Um, over the last couple of weeks, as we've been working through this story, we've looked at uh, a couple of weeks ago, a few weeks ago, the baptism of Jesus, followed by the temptation of Jesus. And we've seen these as these key moments in the preparation that Jesus was going through for his public phase of ministry, which is where we're heading as a church. We're going to begin that series here shortly. This ministry would have Jesus journeying all across Israel with this message of, of hope and forgiveness and, and redemption and restoration and salvation, a ministry which would ultimately lead him to the cross. 
uh, without a doubt, the, the baptism and the temptation of Jesus were, were incredibly significant moments in the life of Jesus. We saw that. But today we're going to sort of look at what happens next. Because up to this point in the story, Jesus has lived in relative obscurity. And we really only know, if you think about it, up to this point in his life, we really only know a tiny bit about his life up till now. But now the pace of this story is about to pick up, and Jesus is going to be at the very center of it. Let's pick things up here in Matthew chapter 4. If you have your Bibles, um, you can turn there with me. This is immediately following um, Matthew's recording of, of the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness. We're going to start in verse 12 and read through verse 22. And it says, Now when they had heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew to Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum by the sea, in the territory of Zebulun and the end of Naphtali, so that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. And for those dwelling in the region and the shadow of death, on them a light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. While walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, and he called them. And immediately they left their boat and their father and followed him. I want us to take a few moments this evening just to work through this passage together. And, and I want to approach it by dealing with this from the perspective of a few different questions. These questions are, why did Jesus go? Where did he go? Whom did Jesus choose? And why did they follow? So let's pick things up here together with this, this first question. Why did Jesus go? The text here indicates that following his baptism in 40 days in the wilderness, Jesus now has received the news that John the Baptist has been arrested. Our account here in the book of Matthew doesn't give us a lot of information or further details about the nature of this arrest, but Luke and the Gospel of Mark fill in some of those details. John the Baptist now has spoken. He was arrested by uh, Herod Antipas, who is the son of Herod the Great. And he's arrested because John has publicly rebuked Herod for marrying his brother Philip's wife, uh, Herodias. Um, and, and as a result... Uh, John the Baptist is arrested and thrown in prison. So now there's this kind of this, this season of unrest in the, region, uh, in the region. And according to the text, this news of John the Baptist has now um, come to Jesus and he heads north to Galilee. And I don't mean to suggest here that Jesus is, is running away from trouble. We, uh, we know that much later in the story, even when he knew that it would cost him his life, Scripture says that he set his face to Jerusalem. This is just simply not yet his time. Jesus isn't running away from trouble, but there are a couple of things related to the motivation, the why, that I think are important for us to notice. The first, I think, is somewhat obvious in the text, but it says that this is, he is fulfilling prophecy. This is a fulfillment of prophecy. Matthew here quotes directly from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 9. This is a text that we oftentimes read um, at Christmas. A quote from the heart of Isaiah's messianic prophecies regarding the coming Messiah. This decision here to go north, to go to Galilee, is, is prophecy fulfilled. And it provides evidence uh, regarding who Jesus is and what he has come to do. But I think beyond that here, this, this motivation to go, the why, is that this is a strategic decision. It's important here to pay attention to where Jesus goes. 
And the passage, quoting Isaiah, indicates that he went to the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali in verse 15. And generally, if you're anything like me, I have a tendency to read right past those details. Because I don't know where those places are. It's not familiar to me. And so it, it almost seems insignificant. And yet in this case, and, and normally it is significant, and we do need to take note of it. See, what we need to know is that Zebulun and Naphtali were, they were two tribes of Israel. And beyond that, they were the first two tribes of the northern kingdom of Israel that were captured and taken into captivity by the Assyrian Empire. Um, if you want to read about that, go to 2 Kings chapter 15. They were taken into captivity by the Assyrian Empire some 700 years earlier. Jesus here is going to, to the very place where Israel experienced the judgment of God as a result of their disobedience some seven centuries earlier. He's going back to to the place where they had failed in order to, to begin the work of the restoration of Israel in all of the Gentile world, the ministry that Jesus would have is going to be launched from this very same place. I think Jesus here is he's returning to ground zero in order to restore his people, to launch his ministry. This is a strategic decision, and I think... I think it points us to something about the nature of God, how he operates. And I don't want to overstate this here, but, but God's desire for us, for his people, for this world, is to get at the root of the problem. To go back to ground zero, to begin to restore at the very place of the struggle. I think of it like this, and, and maybe this is helpful for you too. I think oftentimes in my life, I have a tendency to sort of focus on like behavior modica- uh, modification, right? I think about those things that I'm struggling with or areas where there's sin in my life, and I'm like, if I correct this habit or if I correct this behavior, then things will be right. But I'm not sure that that's God's desire. Again, obviously, he wants the behavior to be in line with his will, But his desire is to transform my heart. He wants to get at the root. Why why am I acting out that way? Why am I failing to trust him there? Have I not experienced him in, in a personal, real way? He wants to change my heart. And out of a changed heart, my behavior begins to change. Jesus goes back to to ground zero. God goes to ground zero in our hearts, in our lives, in order to transform us. I think that's something of the nature of what's happening in this text. As we move on then, we looked at, at why he went. And let's take a moment to consider where he went. And I, I spoke to this a little bit as we, as we looked at some of the motivation that's taking place here. But I want to develop this a bit further. The text describes this area as Galilee of the Gentiles. Um, a people dwelling in darkness. And again, I think there's something for us to pick up on here. As the church, following Jesus will oftentimes take us into spiritually dark places. That's that's what he does. That's where he goes. That's the mission that he left us with. We see that happening here in the text. The the first century uh, Jewish historian Josephus talks about this region uh, uh, indicating that it it was rapidly growing. Um, it was being developed by, by the Roman Empire at this time. And there were two major cities in this region, Tiberius and Sephorus, centers of, of the cultural elite, of, of the educated, of, of people of influence. From a strategic perspective, if you were going to start a movement that was going to change the world, if you were going to launch something that was radically different, then these are the places that you would have gone to these massive cities where you could quickly get crowds and and people around you who could carry on the cause, right? But that's not what Jesus does. This isn't his approach. Instead, the text says that he went and lived in Capernaum by the sea, a small, rural, out-of-the-way fishing village. 
This was the hometown of, of Matthew, as well as Simon, who's later called Peter, and his brother Andrew. Capernaum would serve as something of a home base for Jesus and his disciples over their next two years of ministry. And just north of Capernaum, I actually have a map to put up here. So this is the um, Sea of Galilee here. You can see Capernaum kind of up there to the north. Just north of that is Bethsidia, which is an even smaller, seemingly less significant a uh, village, fishing village. It's actually the name of that town literally translates um, house of fish. So you kind of got what they were about. And this was likely the home of James and John, the sons of, of Zebedee. And why is all of this significant? Where Jesus is going now in this text, this background information is it's showing us something about who Jesus chooses as his followers, what was important to him. Which leads us now to our third question, which is simply, who did Jesus choose? Who did he choose? In, a, in, a, in addition to Jesus going to this region to make an intentional statement about his prophetic ministry and God's grand redemptive plan for humanity, he is here specifically to choose 12 men to follow him, to be his disciples, 12 individuals to invest in, to train and to teach, and then to release, to continue his mission when he's gone. This is an absolutely critical component to the mission and to the purpose of his plan. This is also, by the way, mission critical to us as the church to this day. This is still the call to reproduce disciples who will continue in the mission, who understand the cause, who are invested in it, trained up in it to continue the work. This is the model that Jesus left with his disciples some 2,000 years ago, and it's the very same model that we continue to try to live out as best as we can, we learn every day as the church, the ministry that he's given us here. Jesus now is looking to recruit his followers, those that he will leave with his mission. And he doesn't go to the big cities. He doesn't go to the best schools. He goes to small rural fishing villages. And now I, if we can kind of take a moment to take in this scene. Because if you ever wondered, when you read a story like this, Simon, Andrew, James, and John have this interaction with Jesus, and they seemingly drop everything, their nets, their families, their security, everything that was known and comfortable to them, and they just take off, leaving their father sitting in a boat behind them. Like, it, it feels abrupt. And, and the challenge for us is we approach a text like this and we have our sort of modern um, uh, Western mindset that we bring into this, this experience and this interaction. And, and the picture, and I don't know if you're anything like this, the picture in my head for me as I think about this text, it's often been informed more by like images that I grew up seeing in like a children's picture Bible or one of those bad like Christian movies that was made where Jesus is like a, a strangely kind of Caucasian looking dude with a bathrobe and a blue beauty pageant sash on and, and he's sort of walking along with a long flowing hair and, and a neatly trimmed beard and he just comes up to these guys and, and says, hey, come follow me, I'll make you fishers of men and they're just kind of in this trance where they just get up and leave everything and follow Jesus. Like, it's, like I kind of have, that's what I picture or imagine. But in order for us to, to look at this text, and, and we recognize that's not what's going on here. That's not what's transpired. But when I look at it through the lens of my culture, it's, it almost reads that way to me. In order for us to understand what's taking place here, we need some background first into that first century Jewish culture to what Jewish life and Jewish education was like in a fishing village like Capernaum or Bethsidia. And, and much of the information that I'm going to share with you right now 
is, came from K.E. Bailey, who is a New Testament cultural scholar, and, and Ray Vanderland, who is a teacher and a, a researcher of, of first century Jewish culture, and by way of Jeff Frazier. So, okay, so all those names I threw out, he just tells me about this stuff. Actually, this was made sort of um, about 10 years ago. A lot of this information um, was, was kind of culturally popular in the Christian realm because a, a former pastor by the name of Rob Bell did a, a video that was focusing on some of these same various traits. I don't uh, necessarily recommend Rob Bell's current work, but um, some of this stuff that he did 10 years ago uh, is really helpful in understanding this. He actually was a student of Ray Vanderland at the time um, that he did some of this. I want to put up a picture here of, um, this is in Capernaum. It's in um, a synagogue, there it is, a synagogue um, ruins that is in this village to this day. And, and most villages at the time had a synagogue. It was a place where the Torah was read out loud and, and taught. It was the religious and social center of village life, and it was the local school, the means by which they educated their children. And, and in Jewish culture, they took religious education extremely seriously. Matter of fact, Josephus, the same historian, the first century Jewish historian that I quoted earlier, said, above all else, we pride ourselves on the education of our children. So there was a school system, and by the time a Jewish child was six years old, they would enter into the first step of their educational program. It was called Bet Sefer. Um, and, and this went from about six to ten years old. And, and primarily what they focused on in this stage of the education system was the memorization of the Torah. So between the ages of 6 and 10, Jewish children would entirely memorize the first five books of our Old Testament, which makes you wonder what our kids are memorizing. You know, it's like my kids know movie quotes and, and video games and YouTube links. I mean, it's, it's, it's incredible when you think about it. But this was the primary basis, the foundation of education in the first century Jewish culture. And every child was a part of this. At the end of this section of their education, the elite students, those that had thrived, would be invited to continue. So if you excelled at that level, then you were invited to continue on. Most who, who were average, who just kind of got by, they would go back. They would, they would begin to, to help their families out or, or whatever it is, but they wouldn't continue in the educational program. But a few did, um, the exceptional. And so then this section of education is called Bet Midrash, which means house of study. This was primarily 10 to 14 years of, of age at this time. They continue now in the memorization of most of the rest of the Old Testament. So if you were at this level of education in that culture, you would begin to memorize almost our entire Old Testament. And you would begin to study rabbinical interpretation. So not only are you memorizing it, you're beginning to study how other rabbis have looked at this, how they studied scripture, and they would begin to, to understand the different interpretations that various rabbis held. And at the end of this section of their education, once again, now only, only the very best and brightest would be invited to move on. At this point in time, the vast majority concluded their education and returned to learn their family trade. As we saw, these guys were fishermen. They were going back to, to invest in their family business. But the best of the best, the, the very exceptional, the, the Harvard and Yale students of first century Jewish culture would be invited into what was called Bet Talmud, house of learning. And this is different. This isn't a school in the same sense that the previous two were. This is something closer to an apprentice. 
It was how you became a Talmud, a disciple. One of these students would, would at this point in time in their education, um, who were the very best of the best, would approach a rabbi and ask if he could be one of their disciples, if he could be one of his disciples. Even at that point, most were turned away. But after questioning and, and observing, if a rabbi believed that you had what it took to be like him, he would turn to, to his disciple, to this Talmud, and he would say, come, follow me. That was an invitation. It was an invitation to learn from the rabbi, to become one of his disciples. Now you are officially in as a part of this program. And in this culture, at this time, this would have been the highest honor. This would have been what every parent dreamed of for their child. And here's the thing. A student, a tell me a disciple, didn't merely want to know what their rabbi knew. He wanted to be who their rabbi was. And this brings us to our fourth and final question then. Why did they follow? This, this interaction, as we've seen, unfolds here on the water. Peter, Andrew, James, and John, they've, they've returned to the family business. They were fishermen just like their fathers had been fishermen. They weren't the top of the class. And this doesn't mean that they were failures or, or that they were rejects. They just didn't have what it takes to be the disciple of a rabbi. They were not the best students of their day. Just like everyone else, they had gone back. They were ordinary, average. They were nothing special. If you remember when we were studying the book of Acts in Acts chapter 4, there's a moment where uh, Peter and John are standing before the Sanhedrin after they've been called in and, and rebuked for preaching the gospel. And the Sanhedrin listened to them, and this is their response. He says, when they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished. And they took note that these men had been with Jesus. And this is the, the understanding. This is what they noticed about who they were. And, and just kind of beyond all of that, most New Testament historians and scholars believe that these disciples were likely now somewhere between the age of about 16 to 20 years old. Again, most of the time in like movies or books or something like that, I'm picturing like guys in their 30s or 40s. They were very likely teenagers. Peter is, is thought to be the oldest of them, and he was probably somewhere in his mid-20s. And they, at, at this point too, Andrew and Peter, prior to this, they had encountered Jesus before. In John chapter 1, we see that they had met Jesus through the ministry of John the Baptist. And at that moment, Jesus doesn't call them to follow him. So now they are in their fishing boat. We can imagine these guys sitting there with their fathers, mending their nets, tending to the family business, and, and along comes Jesus, a rabbi, who looks out at them across the water who walks up and says, come, come follow me. This is what is extraordinary in this passage. Is that it is Jesus, the rabbi, who approaches the potential disciple. And, and later in, in John's gospel, he records Jesus as saying, remember, you did not choose me. I chose you. Oftentimes when I have thought about, I've preached or taught this passage, I've, I've taught it from the perspective of the disciples. And I've taught about it from the perspective of saying, like, look at this radical obedience, right? They left everything to go follow Jesus. But that's not the radical thing in this text. The radical thing in this text is that Jesus, the rabbi, extends the invitation. He goes to them and he says, I believe that you have what it takes. I believe that you can be like me. So, of course, when Jesus looks at them and says, come and follow me, they drop everything. Notice Zebedee, their father. There's no 
record of him protesting or, or asking any question. A rabbi has invited them in to be like him. And here's the thing I want us to understand today is that your rabbi thinks that you have what it takes to follow him too. This is the message of the gospel. That he extends the same invitation to us as he did to his first disciples to come and follow him to be like him. The question that you and I have to address here this evening is what has our response been? Will we leave it all to come and follow him or are we still clinging to something? Oftentimes we talk about our need to believe in Jesus, and that is absolutely crystal clear in Scripture, unarguable. But I neglect to understand that apparently Jesus also believes in me. That he believes in you. That is, that he believes that you have what it takes to be like him. That is the transforming power of the gospel. Would you pray with me?